Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, CIDA Connects. And this evening, we have got a, a really fascinating um, series of presentations from members of the Educational Analytic Ser Analytical Services of the Scottish Government. Now, they're going to go through um, explaining to us some of the data they've got. Uh, and at the end of, of those series of presentations, I'm delighted that Stuart Hall from the Robert Owen Centre in the School of Education, University of Glasgow, is going to make a response and talk about how perhaps we could use some of these data sets in educational research um, in Scotland. So thank you for joining us. Uh, at the very end, we will have a we'll have a, a short period of time for discussion. Thank you for joining us, uh, and we'll begin with our first speaker, which is Elizabeth. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thanks, Angela. Sorting out our IT. Uh, before we talk in detail about the data sets that are available um, from SG for further data linkage, uh, I just wanted to talk a bit about uh, the context uh, under which this sits, which is Scottish Government's plan for school research. Um, the plan for school research was published in August 2023 and follows the previous uh, research strategy for Scottish education. So, Angela, if you could skip on a couple of slides, please. Perfect, thank you. So, in terms of the um, the aim for the research plan, it's really about um, evidence-based policy making. Um, that's our, our overarching aim that we're seeking to achieve, uh, underpan, underpinned rather by um, a suite of um, evidence of various types to support. Scottish Government's and wider policy needs. Um, the context is quite different this time around for a refreshed plan uh, as opposed to the previous research strategy uh, given the global pandemic situation and given the um, context of education reform which is on ongoing. Um, so the plan itself has four objectives which you can see there. Uh, primarily around um, delivering robust evidence base, collaborating with our partners, supporting independent research and continuing to prove data access. And it's that data access and data sets which we'll hear more detail on as the evening progresses. And I'll talk about those objectives one by one. So if we could skip on to the next slide. Thanks, Angela. So objective one is really about primarily identifying our research needs. Um, in the policy environment in Scotland and in the education um, sphere that's really about, as I say, the post-pandemic education recovery uh, is an important context, education reform, a uh, context, um, health and well-being of pupils as an identified research need and also raising attainment and closing the poverty related attainment gap. So those are all detailed in the research plan and available for you to read in more detail if, you, if you'd if you so like. Um, and then secondary to that, it's about the Scottish Government's production of evidence base uh, to inform those policy needs. And that can range from our official statistics publications, um, research outputs, evaluation outputs, for example, on the Attainment Scotland Fund related to the Scottish Attainment Challenge. Um, and that's really about the body of evidence that we make available to um, meet those identified policy needs. So if we go on to um, the next slide, please. So our second objective is about collaboration with key partners. And this, this is really in recognition of the fact that we can't do it alone. Um, and the evidence base is best served, not just by government um, statistics and research, but by a wider research community. Um, in terms of the specifics around how that is taken forward in the research plan. Um, it's reaffirming our commitment to cross-sector collaboration and we do that through continuation of the National Advisory Group and the Academic Reference Group. And through those forums, we are seeking to uh, identify joint priorities. Um, we're also quite cognizant of the, the context of education reform and um, the potential new bodies providing further scope uh, and opportunity to strengthen the research base in Scotland through 
uh, specific research functions of any uh, potential improvement agency or a refer reformed um, qualification agency with a strengthened re research function, which is already coming to the fore. Um, so that's going to present um, better opportunities for strengthened research and collaboration between those organisations. Thanks, Angela. Next slide. As well as those key partners, um, academic community is obviously included in that um, uh, scope as well. Um, we're definitely focused on the value that uh, academic-led research uh, adds to policymaking and the education um, sector. Uh, we've got existing mechanisms for doing that through the um, academic reference group and there's a seminar series um, organised in-house which shares and promotes ongoing independent academic research and makes the links between that research and its customers and the, the policy users, um, if you like. But we're also seeking to um, create new opportunities to support independent research, um, particularly with a focus on young um, career education researchers. Um, we already have opportunities for paid internships and um, we're seeking to um, increase the membership of the academic reference group to include um, younger uh, postdoc membership so that we hear from a better um, range of voice um, in that space. Just moving on to the next slide please Angela. And our fourth and final objective of the, the research plan for Scottish education and this is about um, most primarily linked to tonight's topic of improving data access um, and maximising the use made and the value of existing data sets uh, and around um, better use of administrative data, data linkage to get the most uh, meaningful and impact of, um, impactful analysis out of data sources that we already hold. Um, so objective four is about better promoting um, the availability of those data and better supporting the uh, academic community to uh, access those data and make use of them. So in terms of the specific data sets available, that takes us neatly onto our next speaker, uh, Keith, who's going to talk a bit about PISA data. Thanks, Keith. Uh, thanks, Elizabeth. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Keith Driver. I'm a researcher at the Scottish Government and Learning Analysis. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about PISA. Um, I'm going to tell you uh, about the uh, data set itself, the assessment, uh, and why we want academic researchers to make best use of it. And then I'm going to hand over to Amalia from the University of Edinburgh, who's going to talk about her PhD uh, studentship using PISA data, which we're all very excited about. Um, so you can just go to the next slide, please, uh, Angela, and then the next one, please. Thanks. Uh, so PISA is a hot topic at the moment, so that's why we're, we're starting. Um, the next PISA uh, assessment uh, is published in, well, 5th December this year. So only, what, five weeks to go until the, the next um, report. So PISA is, is the Programme for International Student Assessment. It's an assessment of 15-year-old schools, which are termed as necessary for participation in society. It takes place on a, a three-year cycle. Uh, and this is school-based, and it assesses performance in maths, reading, and science. It's a two-hour online assessment undertaken in schools, uh, and it's a huge undertaking. So there are over 80 countries. I think they're approaching 100 for um, PISA 2025 countries taking part, with over 800,000 students. So it's probably the best-known international assessment in education and probably the biggest data, data set as well. Um, it's been going since the year 2000s, so there's data from internationally and in Scotland uh, for all of those um, cycles. It's not just the assessment, so there's a background questionnaire where people answer questions about themselves, their attitudes, dispositions and beliefs, their home life and their school and learning experiences. So some of the, um, the most powerful aspects of the PISA data set is the links you can make between backgrounds and uh, achievement and uh, the assessment. The results are always high profile uh, and they're often viewed as an international league table. It's also the only international survey that Scotland has taken part in since the year 2007, though we're rejoining TIMS and PEARLS to the other big um, international assessments. Uh, but you, you certainly wouldn't miss it every three years. Um, it does make a big uh, fuss in the media. So um, next slide please, Angela. <clears throat> 
in Scotland. Um, there are over 3,000 pupils take part, and that's about 119 schools across Scotland. So it's about a third of uh, high schools take part in each cycle. In each of the assessments, uh, one of the maths, reading and science is a major domain. That means participating pupils answer more questions um, on this subject. So this time around, it's maths, along more detailed data. Pupils are also asked about their attitudes towards and experiencing uh, experiences of learning maths. It's asked questions around maths anxiety, their uh, desire to have a career based around maths, their experience of maths lessons, um, how it's promoted in their home life as well. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, there's also an innovative domain in each PISA assessment. This time, this is creative thinking. So we took part in the questionnaire around creative thinking, which asks about students' beliefs and attitudes and experiences of learning and their perception of themselves uh, as being creative. Uh, this piece has also been termed as the COVID edition in that there's people questionnaire asks about experiences of home learning and digital. So there's some really in que interesting questions around people's experiences of learning at home. Uh, next slide, please, Angela. So in terms of utilizing data, so Scottish government analysts, including myself, are currently analyzing the data and drafting the national reports on the results, which are published on the 5th of December. And that's alongside all the other international and national reports on that day. But we're currently considering a reporting and dissemination plan, uh, which includes a PISA, PISA bite-sized series of reports. So we're looking at how we can explore key areas in more detail. What we'd really like to encourage though is the secondary research. So actually the international data set of all countries is available from that date from the OECD. So you can pretty much download the data. This can be then linked to administrative data in education, including um, data such as SQA results, ASL data, health and wellbeing census, attendance and absence data, positive destinations. So there's huge potential in linking the data. I think there's particular value in linking student beliefs and performance in PISA with education outcomes, um, both up to this point and then after the PISA assessments. And as I mentioned, huge potential, but underused nationally and internationally. Um, and part of the PISA governing boards and pretty much every country talks about the fact that they want to encourage academics into this space. Um, and it's perhaps underused, so that's something we want to encourage. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, so very quickly, th this is what results look like. So this is Scotland's results in reading over time since the year 2000. So you can see a, a varying um, scores, and we'll add 2022 uh, next to that. And uh, next slide, please. Um, this is the kind of school league, league table part, but we, we don't want to reduce it just to this, but you can see this is for reading maths and science, and you can see at the bottom the countries that are above Scotland, and at the top the countries that are below. So you can see in reading, Scotland is relatively well placed internationally, but less so in mathematics. And uh, last slide, please. But it's not just about the scores. So a few insights from PISA 2018. So we know students in Scotland do better in the PISA assessments if they have a positive growth mindset, but that students in Scotland are more likely to have a fear of failure, al almost more than any other country, but that seems to be a UK finding. Students do better in Scotland and the UK when they think their teacher is enthusiastic. And equally, they're more positive about their teachers than the OECD average. And interestingly, um, students are happier with life when they feel that they belong at their school. So some interesting insights. But I'm going to hand over to Amalia for uh, more interesting insights. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Keith. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Amalia. I'm a PhD student at the Murray House School of Education and Sport, University of Edinburgh. Um, I think this is like really nice because we are trying um, to use to utilize PISA data and then linked with the administrative data to answer social research questions. So I'm going to present um, a little bit about my PhD and then the data set that I'm using, what it means by linked data set and also potential policy contributions that I expect um, to, to, to give to the Scottish government and the society. So um, my PhD, um, this is entitled Using PISA, SQA, and School Census Data to Investigate the Role of Family and School Factors on STEM Subject Choices, where STEM stands, or stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. Next slide, please. 
Yes, so um, so I have three research questions basically in the PhD thesis, uh, in my PhD that I'm trying to answer. The first one is gender inequalities in STEM subject choices. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, which includes like whether there are gender gaps in choosing STEM subjects and then what's the role of academic performance where one of the variable that I'm using to measure academic performance is PISA test score, particularly in science and mathematics. And also whether attitude towards science at the age of 15 also explains the gender inequalities in STEM. And then the second block of, the, of my research questions is to explore the social inequalities in STEM subject choices, which include uh, whether there are socioeconomic gaps in choosing STEMs and what's the role of academic performance. And then the third block of my research question is analyzing school factors, teaching practices, and STEM, whether there are school factors such as socioeconomic school, socioeconomic com composition, and also peer subject choices and some teaching practices and how these factors influence students' subject choices. Um, thank you, Angela. Next slide, please. Yeah. To answer those, those research questions, I am using three linked data sets, which I am very grateful to have access from the um, uh, from the Education Analytical Services team. The first data set that I'm using is PISA 2015, um, which um, Keith already explained, this is administered every three years. I'm using 2015, which consists of um, 3,111 pupils distributed across 109 schools. And in this PISA 2015, they are focusing a lot on science. So they have information on, as in addition to the um, science score and reading and mathematics score, they have information on pupils' background, including socioeconomic status, parents' education, and so on, their learning experiences in science class, their motivation, and also views on science. In PISA, there is also school survey, which includes some information on school management, teaching staff, including science teaching staff, and then assessment and evaluation, targeted groups, and school climate in relation to science. The second data set that I'm using is the SQA examinations. So we are collaborating with the um, Education Ethical Services team to link um, the 3,000 pupils who participated in PISA 2015. We link them with their ex SQA examinations result, which SQA is the Scottish Qualifications Attainment Data of pupils participated in PISA. Um, in addition, uh, so we we receive um, very very important information from the SQA, including the qualification type and the level, and then the name of the subject, and then the qualification result, attainment year, and also the stage in which pupils took their examinations. So we link some. Um, background information and psychological assessment from PISA with their actual official SQA examinations. And these two are actually really powerful data set to answer a lot of research questions. And the third data set is the school census data, which is a school level data set of schools who participated in PISA 2015. And in here we have um, school socioeconomic composition variables, including percentage of pupils registered for free school meal, number of pupils in SIMD, and then percentage of pupils from urban rural absence and attendance rate, ethnicity composition, number of pupil, number of pupils with ASN and also EAL. EAL. So linking these three data set, we are trying, I'm trying to answer whether there are um, school fa school factors or whether there are family factors, socioeconomic background, motivation factors, belief factors in choosing STEM in the um, national five higher and advanced higher. And the next slide, please, Angela. Yes, um, the last slide is the policy contribution that I'm hoping to achieve by the end of the, my PhD thesis. The first one is I'm hoping with this linked data set, I can provide recommendations to policymakers and school educators, for example, like how policies should be tailored related to the group characteristics, because uh, maybe students with a different socioeconomic background, they have different needs uh, to encourage them um, to choose certain subjects. Um, the, the second contribution contribution is through this linking data set, I would like to demonstrate the benefits of linking the rich international data sets, as Keith mentioned in his presentation earlier, with the individual level and school level census to answer research and policy questions. Because as Keith mentioned, like the use of um, PISA data is not is still like underutilized. So here I'm going to demonstrate like how we can maximize the use of PISA data, but also but also linking it with the with the potential administrative data. Um, the third potential contribution is 
contributing to the further use of data linkage in Scotland beyond education related topics. I'm hoping that this can inspire because this is the education topics, but I'm hoping with my research, it can inspire other field, for example, like health, family policies, um, children's and young people policies and so on to start looking for the international or national level survey data and then what administrative data available that we can link those data set with. And the last one is like, um, I would like to strengthen the academic and policymaker collaboration and data linkage model, hopefully to be replicated in other countries as well, because again, PISA is an international level of data and how we want to make use of that uh, rich data set as much as we can. Um, yes, I guess that is all on the last slide. I put my um, email. So if you have any questions or like you're interested more in the research that I'm currently um, conducting, feel free to send me an email here. Thank you. So next will be Andrew. Thanks, Malia. Hi, everyone. My name is Andrew White. I'm a statistician. Um, working in the performance and attainment statistics team in the education analytical services. Um, and I just wanted to talk today about the achievement of curriculum for excellence levels or ASO data um, that my team collect and publish data on. Um, just possibly one of the, the slightly less familiar or less well understood um, data collections that we do. Um, if you could move to the next slide, please, Angela. Great. So I just thought to say a little bit about what uh, ASIL, which I'll refer to as uh, throughout the rest of the uh, presentation, what ASIL is, what we collect, um, kind of how we collect it, a little bit about that, uh, and then say something about kind of what, our, what the, is currently happening development-wise, some of which might be relevant to, to folk um, accessing this data in the future for um, data linkage projects, for example. So um, ASIL then, it's a data collection that provides information on the proportion of people's uh, school pupils who are achieving the expected curriculum for excellence levels in reading and writing, listening and talking literacy, which is basically the kind of combination of those first three. So if someone's achieving the expected level in the first three of those, then they're said to be achieving the expected level in literacy, and then also in numeracy. Um, and I'll say a little bit more, a little bit more about what we mean about expected level in just a, a second or two. Uh, the data is based on teachers' professional judgments of individual pupil performance. And those judgments um, relate to the position uh, basically the, toward the end of the academic year. And we're covering uh, pupils in primary one, primary four, primary seven, and in secondary three. And those are the kind of rough ages at the time when those judgments are made uh, in the brackets there. So you can move on to the next slide, please, Angela. Um, yeah, so we're going to talk about expected, le uh, expected levels. And these are those, I suppose. So. Um, we're looking at the broad general education phase of education in Scotland, so from primary one through to S3, and there are uh, four levels, um, sort of five levels, that kind of describe um, what we might expect uh, a pupil to be achieving. Um, so in primary one, a pupil, uh, or between primary uh, preschool and primary one, those will be working at early level, uh, two to four, first level, and so on. And there are kind of details of what we may expect um, to be achieving against each of those levels um, that are kind of available and that teachers use to determine what levels pupils are kind of performing at. Um, if we move on to the next slide, please. So yeah, teachers then use a range of sources to come up with their, uh, their judgments. These are just a few, um, not an exhaustive list necessarily, but the, you know, observing pupils in the classroom, uh, making use of standardized assessments, and talking to young people about their learning, these sorts of things are used by teachers to determine what level they're um, performing at. And we've been collecting this data since 2016-17, or that's at least the, the first year for which we kind of make comparisons in our in our published data. Um, and the latest information we have is for 2021-22, and we're going to have 2022-23 data on the 12th of December, uh, or published on the 12th of December. Um, and just to mention that we didn't collect data in 2019-20 because schools were closed on the, the date that would have been the ASO census date. Um, and so we didn't collect any data on that uh, in that year. And then in 2020-21, we collected for primary school pupils only. Um, the reason being that the, that was when uh, pupils in secondary schools were um, being assessed 
against assessment national qualifications using a kind of different approach to certification and that involved kind of further pressure on teachers and so we didn't collect secondary school data um, in that year. If we move on to the next slide, please. I just want to say a lot about, about data quality. These um, data are based on teacher judgments, which is a little bit different from a lot of the other data we have. Um, a lot of work goes into ensuring consistency in those judgments. There's a lot of information available to teachers, a lot of support available. Um, and I've mentioned there the quality assurance moderation support officers whose kind of job it is to aid in that um, moderation activity, which takes place within schools, between schools and between local, uh, across local authorities. Um, there are also, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, uh, documents that the experience and outcomes documents, which provide a kind of set of clear and concise statements about children's learning and uh, can be used to help assess progress. And then, as I mentioned also earlier, one of the pieces of evidence that teachers can make use of are the standardised assessments, um, which can help to support teachers' professional judgments, but not to not to replace it, but they can form kind of evidence as part of that. Um, if we can move on. And just so just to add to that, in addition to that, all that kind of work that goes on to ensure the, the kind of consistency of judgments, there's also a lot of work that goes on to ensure the kind of like the quality of the data. Um, th there's a period throughout the summer, really, and into autumn, where local authorities are working closely with schools to ensure that the data they have is of high quality. And then we, in turn, are working closely with local authorities and uh, and by extension schools to kind of further perform further checks. There's a lot of work goes into trying to ensure the, the quality of the data. Um, and I'll move on to the next slide, please, Angela. Uh, and I just thought it would be worth um, putting in a couple of charts just to kind of show the sort of um, information that this uh, publication provides us with. Um, the chart on the left there being for primary school pupils, for, so for primary one, primary four and primary seven pupils combined, it's showing the proportion of pupils who achieved their expected level in numeracy and literacy. And I suppose that the interesting thing is, uh, or one of the interesting things at least, is that kind of drop off between 2018-19 and 2020-21, where we have the kind of impact of the pandemic. Um, obviously, we're missing the 2019-20 data. And then we can see in 2021-22, we've had this um, recovery, but not, not a full recovery. So I think you know, that's quite an interesting, uh, if not surprising, perhaps, uh, result. And on the right there, we've got the same sort of information for ST pupils. And I, I suspect we see the same pattern um, as we do for primary, except that we're missing the additional year of data in 2021. Um, and I think I have one more slide just to briefly mention some developments. So just that I'd mention that we're currently having these statistics assessed against the Code of Practice by the Office of Statistics Regulation, um, who are kind of determining whether these statistics can be badged as accredited official statistics, which were formerly called national statistics. Um, they were going to make a, a number of recommendations about what we should do to um, kind of improve the statistics uh, and, and to improve, perhaps more to improve how widely they are understood um, uh, by kind of people who are using them. Um, we won't get that all done in time for the, the 12th of December publication, but we'd be hoping that by next year the statistics would be um, accredited official statistics, which would give kind of further evidence of the of their kind of trustworthiness, I suppose. And then the final point there, um, we're working with Administrative Data Research Scotland to make the ESO data um, available there and, and therefore more easily available for linkage projects. We're in the kind of latter stages of that and uh, expect that to be available uh, via ADR Scotland um, fairly soon, although I don't have an exact time scale for that. Um, that's all I wanted to say, and I think I'm passing to Gary. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so hello, hello everybody, I'm Gary Sutton, I'm a statistician also in, in Education and Analytical Services in the Scottish Government um, and I'm going to talk uh, very briefly about the Health and Wellbeing Census that some of you may be familiar with and also um, how you go about uh, putting in a request to access Scottish Government data in the round. Uh, so next slide please Angela. So these are, this is just a cover slide uh, for those of you that are familiar with the Health and Wellbeing Census. Uh, it, it happened for the first time in Scotland in the 21-22 school year. And some of the screenshots I, I include on that slide show some of the headlines that, that came about as a result of uh, the census going live in, in local authority schools um, and particularly the, the controversial issue around the, the, the fact that the census asks questions on S4 
end up with people's experiences on se on sexual behaviours and sexual experiences. Uh, so next slide, please, Angela. So what is the census? The census is an online survey that asks all children and young people um, to partake in from primary five to secondary six. So roughly in the ages of nine to 18, which is a, a, approximately 450,000 children potentially uh, could have been taking part in this census in the 21-22 school year. The questions questionnaires are age and stage appropriate. So there are technically nine questionnaires, one for each stage that asks pupils of, of those ages and stages, a, a range of questions, and, and I'll cover that on the next slide. Um, the purpose of the census was uh, multifaceted in the fact that it was to cater for the needs at all levels of the system, so to provide Scottish government and ministers with um, national information um, in order to help inform in, um, policy thinking and monitor national policies, but also primarily and first and foremost was actually to provide local authorities, CPPs, schools, so uh, the more local partners of, of, of the system um, with their own evidence to drive forward um, to understand their issues around children's health and well-being in the local area and to drive forward thinking in relation to planning services, targeting resources, um, and again, to see what schools potentially could do to, uh, to help improve children's health and well-being. Um, so because of because it was multi-layered, you know, it was I was I was clear with the, with the implementation of this that I didn't want this just being seen, seen as a Scottish government survey. So flipping around the implementation of it um, was to, was for the Scottish Government to work more collaboratively with local authorities in providing them with the materials and the instruments in order to, for them to undertake their own local health and wellbeing census and all in the same, uh, same school year, which in this case was 21-22 um, school year. The questionnaires themselves, depending on the age, obviously for younger kids, the questionnaires are not as long in length take around 20 minutes, uh, whereas children get older to S4 upwards. Uh, it covers more what people will perceive as sensitive topics and, and other topics. So get longer in length, so it can take about 40 minutes. But the, the criteria is basically to try and enable ch all pupils and students to undertake the census in, in, in a single class time. Um, and it's up to local authorities to arrange locally when the census happened in their local area. Um, the, the field work window as such was from October to April, May time. So again, so, so local authorities work with their schools as to when would be the best time for individual schools in their local area to undertake take the census in order to fit in with things like the exam diets and, 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 and other uh, uh, priorities they've got within schools. Uh, next slide, please, Angela. So here's a list of the topics that were raised for those of you who are aware of the census and the controversies. A lot of it focused on the very last topic on the second column, which is the, the relationships to sexual health topic. But, you know, um, all the commentary and defence we had on, on the census was, you know, it, it was a, a lot, lot broader than that. It covered a range of issues in relation to, you know, you can see here physical activities, mental well-being. You know, smoking, drinking, drug use, uh, whether children themselves were young carers and their caring responsibilities, um, bullying um, and career aspirations. So it, it, it covers a whole raft of themes and topics that um, were deemed important to, for, for all levels of the system to understand and know. Um, so next slide, please, um, Angela. So as I say, the question, the, the health and wellbeing census uh, is, is basically a collaboration between um, the Scottish Government working with other key stakeholders um, who ha have a need for this information, including, like I say, Public Health Scotland. They were heavily involved in helping us um, design the questionnaires with, with researchers who are experts in that field. We had local authorities uh, represented on the groups. We had some schools, um, colleagues on, on the Group Education Scotland. Um, and like I say, we, collect, we, we in effect created nine age, um, individual um, age and stage questionnaires um, that were age and stage appropriate for the children that, that were being asked of, asked of. The questions themselves were drawn from 
uh, primarily drawn from existing health and wellbeing surveys. So he the health behaviours in school-aged children is a, 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 a key international study that Scotland has taken part in since 1990. Um, it happens every four years, but it's only a small sample of 2,000 kids in primary seven, 2,000 in S2 and 2,000 in S4. Uh, are sampled every four years to answer questions of a very similar nature to that in the census, the health and wellbeing census, the which has been which is great and provides us with a great national picture and and also because it's an international study helps us see how our children in Scotland fare compared to children in the I think it's now approaching fifty countries take part in HBSC, but it doesn't provide any local. Um, any breakdowns or local intelligence below the national picture, hence the need for the census. So that even so, even though we were we worked from collaboratively, it was it was up to each local authority to, to decide for themselves whether they were able and willing to take part in the census. Um, we had sixteen authorities take part in the twenty one twenty two census. Uh, the other sixteen were unable to take part for a, a, a multitude of reasons, such as you know still recovering from the. COVID pandemic to issues around the sexual experience questions and, 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 and people not being comfortable with undertaking the census, census because of that in their local area. So there were a range of reasons, but we did get 16 authorities uh, taking part. Um, and did children themselves have to take part? No, the answer to that was no. Um, the, the lawful basis, the legal basis um, for, the, the, for the census happening was um, public task um, but it wasn't obviously a mandatory it's not a legislative legislative requirement that children um, took part in the census and unlike the population census so um, parents and children could opt themselves out if they did not feel comfortable did not wish to take part in the census and even if they started the census they could skip questions they could remove themselves and and end the questionnaire at any time um, so parents, children and young people themselves were in full control of, as to what they said in the census. Um, next slide please Angela. Um, so and were the results published? So again we worked with authorities to help them um, and encourage them to take um, to make use of their data and to make make any information available locally particularly with schools first and foremost um, because part of the feedback we got in the designing of the questionnaires and the actual encouraging authorities to 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 do their census was schools themselves were desperate for information around what the children in their schools were saying so schools themselves didn't have access to the data the data was held by local authorities as children completed the questionnaires so schools in local areas were given uh, summary reports of the, the of the findings based on what their children said um, so we've worked with authorities to help all that happen. From a national perspective, we, we then worked with all 32, well, all 16 authorities in this case to get the data from them at the end of that academic year. So over the summer of 2022, we started receiving the data from the 16 authorities, which accumulated to about 132,000 responses in those 16 authorities, which we then analyzed and published a report at the end of February this year, so end of February 2023. And you can see the link to that publication if you're interested and another link for any further information about the background to the census if you're, you are so inclined to read. I think that's up. Next slide, Angela. Okay, so that's that's the health and wellbeing census. So I'll move on to um, how external researchers uh, look to gain access to our, our data, the data that Education Analytical Services has. Um, so again, next slide, please, um, Angela. So before, before any data access request comes in, we, you know, we strongly encourage people to look at um, what we currently make, already make available on, on our websites or open data platforms. Um, Education Analytical Services has at least these three um, links to the, either information on school education statistics, which is primarily the work of Elizabeth's team, you know, including Andrew. Uh, there's children's social work statistics um, website, which are things like uh, looked after children data and child protection data, and, and another page on the early learning and childcare. So that's you know, children obviously in the, in the preschool phase. 
So we'd encourage people to look there because we do publish, obviously, publications to make available things like supplementary tables, which has a lot of information, breakdowns of information pre-analyzed for you. Um, so we would encourage people to look there. And obviously, there's the open data platform, which is a sort of more legacy system we have had in place for a number of years where we we, we make data available for those who, who need access to it. Um, next slide, please, Angela. But if the information you isn't required there, particularly things like if uh, a key ask is obviously the access to individual level data. So a lot of the data education analytical services gather is at an individual child level. Um, then uh, uh, that would probably require a, a bespoke request. So there's a mailbox, a general Scottish government mailbox, statistics.inquiries at gov.scot to email, um, putting in a request. Um, there's an application process, which basically um, there's a checklist asking you to consult guidance um, as part of the application to complete a data protection impact assessment. So that outlines, for those of you who don't know, that outlines all the risks or why you want the data, the risks of you having that data and how you're going to mitigate those risks, etc. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a legal requirement for any um, any processing of data, particularly personal data that you are going to have in your possession, or have access to. Again, stating the lawful basis uh, of why you need access to that. So data access requests usually is because it'll be of public benefit. So again, um, that's usually the primary reason we would ever share data with, with researchers is that there is a public benefit to the research that you'll be doing. Um, obviously, speak to the statisticians um, who are responsible for those data sets. So if it was, say, ACEL data, as Andrew's just been talking about, you would you know have a chat with Andrew. Or if it was the health and wellbeing census data, you would chat to me or Jill Morton within my, my unit. Um, to talk about what's more about what's gathered in those data collections and would, would that meet the need of your research so it helps you tease out those issues um, and like I say there's a there's a complete checklist um, of things to do to, to, to go through and forms to complete so if you go to the next page please Angela um, as you can see, there's a, there's a screenshot of what those documents are, and at the bottom of that page is, is a link to our Scottish Government web page that helps you, guides you through the process. There's a, there's a flow chart and, and then the application form and, and, and things like that to look through. Basically, once we receive your application, um, there's, if, it's, if, it, if it gets triaged, basically, and if it's, a, if it's a very simple data access request, for example, it's not requiring any data linkage, or it's it, what's it's considered to be a low risk data share based on, a, on an assessment criteria. And again, I think the matrix of risk is the, the risk matrix. Um, if it scores lowly, then it becomes a local issue. So if it was just say you wanted access to some data held by education analytical services, um, and it doesn't require data linkage, it would then it would then get passed over to the relevant um, well my unit to, to lead on the request within education analytical services. However, if it is deemed more high risk or it involves data linkage, then the statistics public benefit privacy panel, uh, um, form a panel who assess the application and may come back with um, additional questions or clarification. Um, people from the relevant areas of the data for which you need access to will be on that panel to, to consider the request. So there's a bit more of a, a, a rigorous process that, um, approval process if, if, it, if, it, if, it, if it's deemed more high risk or um, data linkage project. And then finally, once it's been approved, um, you know, again, it depends on where the data is, as, as Andrew has, was, was just saying, we have been working for the last three or four years and getting our data on ADR Scotland. So that's the sort of repository for holding education analytical services data. But that usually only kicks in if it's a data linkage project. And, and the EDRIS service um, within Public Health Scotland is involved in helping researchers access data for data linkage projects that are held in ADR Scotland. If it was just um, a simple data share, say you need to just access to a single data set and there was no linkage, then there are various approaches that we are still operating to ensure we can share the data we have with external researchers in a safe, secure way. We've recently joined the Safe Pods network, which is an additional thing um, where, the, in effect, the data stays within the Scottish Government, but 
uh, external researchers will go to one of the safe pods that are located throughout the UK and access the data that's still held on Scottish government systems remotely and do their analysis and, and that side of things. So again, it, it, it minimises the need of actually physically sharing the data externally with people. Um, but that's, these are all work and developments and progress. But it was just to say that, you know, there are various means of, and methods that we currently have in place for the sharing and controlling of who has access to our data. So I think that's me. I think that's the last slide, Angela. Um, so obviously, I think we're all happy to take any questions. I, well, I think, thanks for that, uh, Gary. And thanks, everybody, for those uh, extraordinarily interesting presentations. We now have uh, a short response from Stuart Hall from the Robert Owen Centre in the School of Education. Good afternoon, folks. Um, I want to just say a very, very few um, comments because I think it's more important that, that folks get a chance to ask some questions. Um, however, can I firstly say thank you very much for you know, that presentation from uh, Scottish Government colleagues. It, well, I certainly found it uh, very informative and useful and it reminded me, I guess I was reminded of all the things that actually are there and there is a huge amount of, of data available. Um, I was also um, happened to hear lots and lots talked about how data sets are now beginning to be or enabled to be brought together, etc. I, I think many of us out in the field have been talking about those things um, for a long time. Amelie's um, um, presentation I thought was was very helpful in showing us actually how some of those different data sets can be brought together. In her instance, obviously for her PhD, but you can also see how that would be of use in terms of developing Scottish educational policy, et cetera. Um, what I was reflecting on, I suppose, was um, that I and, and many of my colleagues spend a lot of time out in the field with you know, teachers and schools and um, what we've been doing certainly over the last few years is encouraging them to become more research active, to become more aware of, of data and, uh, you know, whatever they can bring that to bear in their own professional situations, I think represents the opportunity for improvement in, in our education system. It's no longer about, you know, hunches and I think if we did this and I think if we did that, actually, if we can ground it in the evidence, you know, that's so much better. And I, and I contrast that with, I suppose, my experience 10 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, when I would regularly be in schools with colleagues and hear teachers saying, no, no, the research and, and the data, that's your job. You're the researcher, it's not ours. Well, I think we've come a long way and it's very much part of, part of their profession. So when you're thinking about access, as you were talking about there, and I guess encouraging and improving access to data sources, I'm thinking about... And there's, it's not just for the small group of educational researchers in Scotland, it's also about educational practitioners and how they can access it and become more familiar with it and, and, and use that to, you know, whether it's closing the attainment gap or, or whatever, that they know about the data sources, they know how to access it, usually via their own local authorities and look at their own results. And I think, I think you know, that's all to the fore and certainly, I see that as, as as a big part of my job over over the next next few years. Um, that access to robust data sources and, and and you know just listening to you talk about the data and the issues and the procedures that you go through in relation to cleaning and checking and all of that stuff. I think I think that's important because I do remember having conversation. Now it is a few years ago, maybe more than ten years, in talking to some Scottish government colleagues who said. Yes, you can go back five years. I wouldn't go any further back beyond that because the data gets a bit sketchy. Um, I suspect, again, we've moved a long way uh, uh, from that. And, and, you know, the data sources are robust. And if there's not, you know exactly what the issues are, where the problems lie, and can recommend to people how best to use uh, the data. So um, widening access to data, and collaboration with key partners. And I bring that round again to say, key partners are the practitioners out there because ultimately they're the ones who will 
promote the changes in the education system. So I'm going to stop at that point, come off my high horse and say once again, thank you very much. And just to open the, the session now for uh, questions. Can I begin with the first question, of course? 